Good morning. Welcome, everyone. It's so good to see you all this morning on this lovely, sunny, cool but sunny spring morning. It's so good to see Roy and Sherry with us uh, this morning. You're so welcome. Uh, glad you could make it. And uh, um, so we're going to go straight into uh, our worship this morning. And uh, we're going to begin with one of the great hymns of the church. Uh, it's uh, uh, number 345 in the hymn book. It's, uh, and can it be that I should gain an interest uh, in the Savior's love? Now, just before, um, just before we start the hymn, just our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 126. Um, if you could put that up there, Andrew. Uh, and this is a, this is a, a cry, uh, this is a, 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 a psalm that would have been sung by the pilgrims as they went to Jerusalem. And I'll explain a little bit about this in my message, but uh, for now we just read these, these words. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. So uh, a story of restoration and of hope and of joy. And we go from there into our hymn, And Can It Be That I Should Gain? an interest in the Savior's blood.
and that hymn, John, Charles Wesley is, is effervescent in his, just his thankfulness of what God has done for him in, in saving him. And it's just a, an anthem of joy and reflects, I suppose, something of that first psalm we read, that just that a gratitude for what God has done for him out of God's mercy. And uh, it just it, it's, a, it's a hymn which exudes joy and hope uh, and certainty in God's grace. We're going to pray together, and we're going to begin with um, words of, of confession. Uh, let us pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. I give you a new commandment, said Jesus, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. So, Lord, you are steadfast in your love and infinite in your mercy. You welcome sinners and invite them to be your guests. We confess our sins, Lord trusting in you to forgive us. Lord, we have so often yielded to temptation and sinned. Lord, have mercy. We have so often turned from our neighbors in need or turned on them in anger. Christ, have mercy. Lord, we have so often resisted your word in our hearts and preferred instead to go our own way. Lord, have mercy. Mighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins. Keep us in life eternal. Amen. Lord, Lord God, you, by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, have delivered and saved the world. We pray, Lord, that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, um, now I've, I, brought, I brought something with me this morning. Um, I don't know if you know, if you can guess what it is. Someone suggested <laughs> a steering wheel, like a helm of a ship. Isn't that what it looks like? Um, it, it, I can tell you, it didn't look like this when we bought. Well, when it was given, it was actually a gift um, to us from our, from Linda's parents. Anybody recognise what it might be? No, <laughs> it's a garden table. It's a garden table, and um, it's it's in a bit of a sorry state um, because you know, as garden furniture, it it gets left out in the rain. We tried to cover it, but this is, this is, like, this is like nearly 20 years old. Um, but it has suffered grievously. Now, um, I, am, oh, I am in the process of restoring this. This is, uh, this is one of the old bits that supported the underneath. And as you can see, it's kind of, uh, it broke off around about there. And it's, you can see how seriously rotten it is. Can you see that? Really bad. And this is, uh, this is one of the top pieces. This is part of the table. And you can see that the water is eaten in and gouged bits out of it. So I've had to treat that and then I'll have to fill it. These bits here, I, uh, I'm very pleased with these. I found an old bit of mahogany in my shed and it was just the right size to cut all these pieces out. And they look just like the originals and um, they're, they're grand. So I have a way to go yet, but it's a work in progress. And what was once beautiful 
and it's become a bit sad, is going to become beautiful again. Now, I've got a little video I'm going to show you about. Uh, now, I'm going to go back because I have to skip through this. The video is 15 minutes long, which is not a good idea this morning. That's worth seeing again. Now, how about that? Just leave that there. Oh, how about that? That was what I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, you can see the whole video on YouTube if you like. I think it was just, there's so many restoration videos um, that you can look at. And it's just wonderful to see how something that was once really beautiful, but has become damaged and broken and neglected, can be restored back to its former glory. And today's service is all about restoring things, about God restoring us in particular. And um, so this is just a, a little illustration, if you like, of how God can take us. We, and you know, every time we get in a, a, a row or an argument or we do something wrong or we forget something or we fall out with our friends or um, we get cross or we get upset or sad, all of, those, all of those things are little signs of us being a little bit broken or a little bit hurt. And God's promise to us that is that he will restore us and he will make us well again. And he will restore God's perfect image in us. Now, there's lots of things there to, to discuss on another time. But um, one of the ways that, as I say, we can we can become a little bit um, hurt or, or, or damaged is, is when we fall out with friends. That can happen very, very easily, whatever age we are. And if we don't fix that, it can be very damaging. It can be very hurtful and it can go on a long time. And so, you know, God wants us to be in restored relationships. He wants us to love our neighbors. He wants us to love one another as he has loved us. And that means that we are prepared to go the extra mile to, to fix and restore friendships when they get hurt or damaged. How do we do that? Any ideas? How can we, if we do something wrong, what can we say to put things right again? Say sorry. Simplest, most easy. Well, I say it's simple and easy. It's, it's kind of simple in a way, but it's very hard sometimes to go to someone and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. 
Um, but if we say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, sometimes we need to do more than just say sorry. There may be something we need to do to change what, what we did before, to make it right. But um, God in his grace, he, he forgives us and he, he, puts the, he puts the grace in our hearts to forgive and to ask for forgiveness as well. And so uh, a friendship that's been broken or damaged or neglected by God's grace, it, it, can, it can be restored again. So look, um, this is a, a simple illustration. It's not a perfect illustration, but... Um, it just says something to us about how God is able to restore and renew and rebuild what was, what was broken. So that's all I wanted to share this morning. And um, <clears throat> so I think our children are going to leave us now for, uh, for kids' faith and uh, for the ark and discussion group. So um, we will see you later. Uh, we'll continue... Um, in a moment with our readings. <clears throat> um, while they're going out, uh, there, there are two readings, one from Isaiah, one from John, so if the readers would like to come up and read those for me, please. First reading is from Isaiah 43, verses 16 to 21. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about half a litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this, because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Thank you. Um, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Nikki. Um, the, the common theme through all our readings today is, uh, is restoration. Uh, whether it's you know, restoring Tonka toys or uh, restoring friendships or restoring um, a nation to its land. Um, and when we look at this passage from, uh, from Isaiah, this, this famous passage, Isaiah writing to a, a people who had been defeated in war and carried off into exile. Uh, they, they desperately, desperately needed hope. They reached out for hope. They, 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 uh, they were a broken people. And 
they had, they had only their, their faith to cling on to and each other. They needed to know, <clears throat> where is God in the midst of my suffering? And many times they cried out to him uh, for help. And uh, they went through a long process of rediscovering what it meant to be the people of God in a, a period of, of suffering. Isaiah points them to their history, <clears throat> to another time that they had been enslaved, that they were escaping through the desert. And in the passage that Neil read, it, it speaks about the, the time when the, uh, the people of Israel escaped from, uh, from uh, Egypt and were being pursued by the Egyptian army. But God miraculously opened up a way through the sea, and they escaped through the sea. And, uh, they, they, and then he provided for them water in the desert. So this powerful image of God's restoring, rescuing power is what is offered to the exiles as, hey, this is what God has done before. This is what he will do again. And in that, they found tremendous hope. Because when the time is right, God will again restore the fortunes of his people and bring them home. Again, I suppose, uh, last week I spoke about, um, or a couple of weeks ago I spoke about Ukraine and, and how we see echoes of what's happening there in Scripture. And here again we see echoes of their story and in, in the cry for help that we hear from them day after day. And the message and the, the, the hope that we find in Scripture is that God will not stay silent, that he will answer in his time and in his way. Psalm 126 is the fulfillment of that promise of hope. Psalm 26 was written many years later during the time of, of that, um, after the return or, du or during the time of that return to their nation, which happened in the next generation. And it was used by pilgrims as they made their way to the temple in Jerusalem to worship together at one of the feasts. It's called a song of ascents, a song of going up to Jerusalem. And it speaks of the joy of their freedom and the, the return to their homeland. It celebrates the way in the desert that was promised by Isaiah. God made a way where they could see no way, and yet he found a way to bring them home. But the restoration at that time is incomplete. They celebrate that God has brought them out from captivity, but there is still so much to be done in restoring them as a people and undoing the brokenness of their past experience. And in verse 4, they cry out in that psalm of joy. They still cry out, restore our fortunes, O Lord. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. And in speaking in these terms of sowing and reaping, there's a recognition that there is a, some time gap between the two. You don't sow and reap instantly. There is a growing season. And that growing season is of unknown length. But the harvest will surely come. And that's the promise. And that's the hope. That, in, uh, that helps us to endure through times of suffering, sadness, and sorrow. We come then to, to John's gospel and this story. Um, and, and John continues telling his story of Jesus' approach to Jerusalem for those final days and for the ultimate uh, sacrifice upon the cross. And this story about Mary and that fragrant ointment comes immediately after, or in the days after, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and on the eve of Palm Sunday, and it's full of prophetic meaning. A similar story is told by Luke um, in, um, of a sinful woman who, who comes to where Jesus is a guest in the Pharisee's home having dinner with him. And uh, she similarly, um, she breaks an alabaster jar and she pours perfume on Jesus' feet. And Simon the Pharisee is indignant about it. Some commentators have said that this is the same woman 
Um, Mary, the, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, and possibly related to Jesus in some way. And, and that this was the beginning of Jesus' relationship with that family. In Luke, the woman's tears are of remorse and repentance uh, in the hope of forgiveness and restoration. And Jesus says to um, her, many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. And then he tells her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. If this is indeed Mary that is spoken of in Luke's gospel, um, then this occasion in John's gospel, her tears are tears of gratitude for restoration received. But in fairness, it's really, it's highly speculative that these are the two, these two are the same person. Uh, we simply don't know that. Um, what we do know is that Mary's actions um, in John's gospel, they reveal a deep love and appreciation for what Jesus has done for her in restoring the life of her brother Lazarus. I suppose, um, if we're honest, we, we need to get over the, the, the cultural difference um, that possibly leaves us feeling a little bit uncomfortable with what was happening around the table that day. I suppose it helps a little to, to understand that when they ate, they didn't sit at a table as we do, uh, which would have been quite um, bizarre um, for this story to happen. But rather, they, um, they were reclining on these sort of chaise long um, uh, chairs, or possibly even on the floor. And so it much more easy for someone to access a person's feet. But let's, let's leave that aside because there is a big difference between the culture that we belong to and the culture uh, and the time in which this story was told. I think the lessons we learn from this, though, are very, very clear and stark. We see three important things about the nature of love in this and the expression of love in this story. We see something about love's extravagance. It meant nothing to Mary that she she broke this really expensive bottle of, wine, of, of, of ointment and poured it on the feet of Jesus. And when she was criticized, Jesus defended her, saying, no, this is, this is in preparation for my burial. Um, and uh, if you want to, <laughs> I suppose it, 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 it says very significantly, it says that the material cost of things is very much less than the sublime value of relationships. You know, we can put a monetary value on things. We can't put a monetary value on relationships. And love has an extravagance that is easily seen, you know, on the day of, on, on Valentine's Day, for example, or for a better example, the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus after his birth. Secondly, we see something about love's humility. There was a humility in the actions of Mary on that day. And um, because she was prepared to, uh, I suppose, um, she was prepared to, to do that for Jesus as a sign of her gratitude. Thirdly, we see love's unselfconsciousness. We are when you truly love someone, you're unselfconscious about your desire to express that, to show that, um, to honor that. And it's always, you know, it's, it's always lovely to see, you know, sort of young lovers walking down, down the, the, the street and, and just how unselfconscious they can be, just gazing in each other's eyes. And, you know, it's, there's a beauty to that. But you know what? I can't help wondering why. Um, Lazarus wasn't more noticeable in this story, in his own expression of gratitude. After all, he was the one raised from the dead. I suppose we can't really make an argument from silence, but it's just a question. You know, gratitude is often very difficult to give. It's often hard to find an appropriate way to say thank you. Think of the... the the 10 men suffering from leprosy uh, who were healed, only one of whom came back to thank Jesus. And I think it's really important that 
we find ways to show gratitude when someone has blessed us in some way. One other key thing, point comes out of this. The fragrance that filled the house that John makes such a big uh, statement about. You know, this was, the, the, I don't know what this, this ointment smelt like. It was a, a very strong perfume, I, I should suggest. And, and it filled the house. And John, in his gospel, often uh, uses, you know, double meanings or multiple meanings in the stories that he tells and, um, and in some of the, uh, the, the characters that he uses. It's not stretching the point to suggest that the genuine heartfelt acts of love that we share um, have an influence to those who see it. It, it, it touches people. And it evokes a response from them. Sometimes the response might be, yes, I could do more to spread the love. Or perhaps there could be a critical response. And we see that in Judas. We see how Judas, in his response, uh, is quite um, critical of what, he has, of what she has done. He's quite begrudging in his reaction. And perhaps there's a, a little bit of a prophetic touch there as to, as to how in just, just exactly seven days later, he would go on to betray Jesus. But I suppose the positive note is when we see other people expressing gratitude in a really good way, we can learn from that. You know, we all need we need it now, or we have in the past needed restoration in our lives. We all of us have experienced brokenness in different ways, sometimes because of the actions of others upon us, sometimes because of reckless or foolish or careless actions or words that we have committed. And it has caused a breakdown in relationships. It has caused damage to somebody. It's caused damage to us, to our hearts, to our spirits. We need restoration. We have that human nature. And in our Wesleyan tradition, we, we say that all people need to be saved. And that's why, because we have all experienced that brokenness. And we can all, and we have all received God's forgiveness for things we have done wrong. Again, in our tradition, we have this phrase, all people can be saved and all people can know that they are saved because we can experience God's forgiveness. And many of us can speak today and openly about how God has touched our lives and saved and restored us. Uh, there was an evangelist who was, uh, he was in college training. Uh, uh, he was uh, for, for ministry and uh, he, he went out with a, a group of students into the center of Belfast to to have an open air meeting. And one of the students was, was telling the story of, of how Jesus turned water into wine. And uh, a small crowd gathered and one of the crowd started heckling at him and criticizing him and insulting him and saying, surely you don't believe that God, that Jesus turned water into wine. And he, he was a bit flummoxed. He didn't know how to respond when somebody else in the crowd then suddenly spoke up and said, he says, leave him alone. He says, I don't know about water into wine, but I'll tell you what Jesus did for me. I was an alcoholic, and he turned wine into furniture in my home and clothes for my children, and he restored my marriage. That's what Jesus did for me. And that expression of, of what Jesus has done is an expression of gratitude and of thankfulness. And it has a fragrance to it that touches the lives of others. And so, when the, the question today is, how do we show our gratitude? We show it in, in several different ways. We show it through a change in the, how we behave. We show it in the change of the values that we hold, in the priorities that we assign to our money, our time, and other resources, and by telling others what he has done for us, and also in how we worship and pray, both when we come together 
and when we are on our own in our rooms. In all of these ways, we show gratitude for the restoration that we have received. And we cry out in hope for the restoration that is yet to come. Let us pray. And so, Lord, we pray today for ourselves. In, we pray, Lord, that you would fill our hearts with gratitude for what you have done for us. And Lord, where there is brokenness in our lives, may we cry out to you in the sure and certain hope that you will come and restore us to life. Father, we pray for your church throughout the world, for its witness, for its worship, for its integrity. We pray, Lord, that we would honor you in all we do and say, that we would truly seek to save the lost and restore the broken. Father, we pray for the nations of the world, and in particular we think of the ongoing war in Ukraine, and for those who continue to flee the fighting to find safety abroad. We pray for those who have come among us. We pray, Lord, that we will find ways to to be agents in your hands towards their own restoration. We pray for those who have power and influence in world affairs, that you will give them wisdom, compassion, and courage. We pray for an end to the influence of those who would seek violence and harm to others. Father, we pray for the powerless, for the victims of famine and war and injustice, wherever they may be. And we pray too, Lord, for those afflicted by bereavement and loss and sorrow. Father, we pray for your comfort, your strength, and your hope. And Father, we remember before you those who have passed from this life and who have lived in faith and obedience. And once again, Lord, we thank you for the life of Cherry Bothwell, who was laid to rest in the past days. Lord, you have given your Son for our salvation and our restoration. You have filled our lives with your presence. You have given us your Holy Spirit to guide, protect, to teach, and to strengthen. Father, help us to live according to your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. We sing our next uh, hymn together. Um, Number 489 in the hymn book, All I Once Held Dear Built My Life Upon.
The um, responses for our communion service will be on the screen. Please do join uh, in the appropriate places. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Yeah, okay, next slide. Blessing and praise belong to you, gracious and eternal God. Through your living word, you created all things. The majesty of the heavens and the glory of the earth. In your wisdom and goodness, you have made all people in your image and likeness. Therefore, with saints and angels and with all creation, we lift up our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise that in the fullness of time you gave your only Son to share our human nature and to be tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. To set his face resolutely towards Jerusalem and to be lifted high upon the cross that he might draw all creation to himself. And when the hour of his glory came and loving his own to his end, he sat with them at supper he took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. In obedience to his command, we recall his sufferings and death, his resurrection and ascension, and we look for his coming in glory. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of Christ, in union with Christ's offering for us, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice. Unite us in love and peace with all your people until with the whole company of heaven we are brought into the presence of your eternal glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, for, forever. Amen. The bread we break as a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup that we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have taught us that what we do for the least of our brothers and sisters, we do also for you. Give us the will to be the servant of others as you are the servant of all. And give up your life, who gave up his life and died for us, but is alive again. Amen. And so our closing, I just said a word of thanks there to, to Peter who's standing in for Amy this morning. Thank you so much, Peter, for your help and assistance this morning. Our final hymn um, is um, we're going to do this together. We haven't uh, rehearsed together, so um, I hope this will go fine. But our final hymn together is um, uh, I Will Offer Up My Life. And I suppose this is a song that, that recognizes what God has done for us and, and expresses that desire, uh, you know, to give everything to him in return. I will together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.